Uh, and just a, an introduction, uh, Dan is an associate professor of astronomy at UC Berkeley and an observational astronomer. His research is centered around the local universe. He uses facilities such as the Hubble Space Telescope, Keck, and soon the James Webb Space Telescope, along with archeological techniques to reconstruct the formation histories of local galaxies. He has been at the forefront of near field cosmology, which connects the fossil record of local galaxies to our theoretical and observational knowledge of the very early universe. He has received national and international recognition for his research, including an Alfred P. Sloan Fellowship, and the Alexander von Humboldt Fellowship, and a 2019 Newton Lacey Pierce Prize for Outstanding Achievements in Observational Astronomy, awarded by the American Astronomical Society. As principal investigator of the James Webb Space Telescope, early release science program for resolved stellar populations, Weiss will be one of the first people to use the James Webb Telescope. And I think hopefully we're going to be one of the uh, first groups to hear about that telescope and uh, its uses in detail. So with that, Dan, take it away. The floor is yours, or the Zoom Great. is yours, as we say. Hey, thank you so much. So let me just bring up my slides. <clears throat> there we go. All right. So hopefully everyone can see that. Great. Yeah. All right. So. Um, I am really pleased to be here and thank you all for being here tonight. Um, I really love the opportunity to talk about not only the work that I do, but just a lot of the, the space telescope aspects that go into this type of science that um, we don't we don't talk about as much in, in, in you know, normal technical talks. And so there's a lot of uh, in intriguing stuff going on, if, as you'll find out tonight. Um, so I'm going to, let's see, clear away some of this text. And you'll notice that we've been scrolling through this image in the background. And this is, in fact, one of the largest astronomical images ever created. Uh, it was created with the Hubble Space Telescope. And it's a, an image uh, of our neighboring galaxy, Andromeda. Um, it's 1.6 gigapixels in size. So that means it would take about 600 HD TVs to display it in full resolution. And in fact, at a recent meeting of the American Astronomical Society, we printed out a version of this and put it up on the wall. So it's, it's pretty incredible. Uh, it is among the largest astronomical images ever taken. And it was created with the Hubble Space Telescope and it took about 800 hours of Hubble time. Um, that, must have been, that must have been some wall. To create. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was pretty spectacular. Um, so what I want to do is just talk about what led up to the creation of this? Because as you know, Hubble wasn't supposed to last as long as it has. And um, you know, it's, it's now in its 30th year. Uh, and so, so much went into the creation of this image and all sorts of other types of science. Um, so this, uh, this is Hubble. Um, you can see it orbiting uh, Earth in this picture. Um, there's a lot of interesting things to know about Hubble or things you may not know. Um, one is that it was the first and only mission at the time designed to be serviced by astronauts. So people had been playing around with launching satellites kind of in the 70s, 80s, and, and since then. But this is one where they said, well, we're putting so much into it, we need to be able to fix it. So in fact, it's orbiting Earth in what's called a geosynchronous orbit. So it's about 400 miles above Earth. Uh, it was launched in April of 1990. And there, you know, the idea of having it close is that it's easy to fix and upgrade. Um, there were some there are some cons, of course, in that the atmosphere of Earth um, tends to drag it down, so you have to keep um, boosting it back up into orbit, or it would crash into the Earth. Uh, and then there's other issues like the Earth gets in the way of the observations, and there's uh, actually reflected light off the Earth that can make it difficult too. But nevertheless, as you already know, Hubble has been spectacularly successful. Uh, though it only it launched in 1990, it had roughly been about 50 years in the making um, before its launch. And so the idea of something like Hubble was first proposed in a paper by a professor at Princeton. Uh, you may have heard of him. You may not have. His name is Lyman Spitzer. He's, he's famous. In fact, has another space telescope named after him. And in 1946, he wrote a paper that talked about what it would be like for astronomy to have a telescope outside of of the Earth's atmosphere. Um, and he considered a few options, like a really small one and a really big one, and talked about the type of science they could do and what the, the technical benefits would be. And so 
just to, you know, not to drag you through this whole paper, though it is really interesting, um, I've just sort of highlighted uh, the, the two main scientific benefits. Uh, the, the first is that we can, if you had a, if you have a telescope above the Earth's atmosphere, is you can observe at wavelengths otherwise blocked by the Earth's atmosphere. So as you know, the, the Earth blocks, say, UV light, um, and it also makes it difficult to, to observe and it's in other frequencies like in the radio or the infrared at very specific areas. Um, and so, but if you have a telescope above the atmosphere, you don't run into any of these problems. So that was one main advantage. Um, and the other is that you get this, you get what's called better angular resolution than is possible from the ground. And this just means that it's, you can more cleanly separate two objects that appear to be um, closely located together. And I'll, I'll demonstrate uh, that effect in a second. But, but it was for these primary technical reasons that Spitzer advocated for a telescope in space. And in fact, from 1946 until, until the 90s, this is really what he did was went and built the case for a space telescope by, launch, you know, by taking this theoretical concept and then making it more and more concrete by launching very small telescopes into orbit uh, to show that they would work and then eventually building up to something like Hubble. So he really dedicated his entire career to making this happen. So um, coming back to point two, this better angular resolution. So what does that really mean? Well, this is a little graphic that's, that demonstrates it. So imagine that we have a, a star somewhere in space and a telescope somewhere on the ground and this yellow ray represents the light. What happens is the light from the star hits the Earth's atmosphere and it bounces around because there are all these particles and turbulent behavior. If you're on an airplane, you know, you feel some of this behavior when there's turbulence and then it, it, it hits your telescope. And um, what happens is what you actually see at the telescope shown here is that the star is slightly moving around due to all this turbulence in the atmosphere. And so it's, it's pretty clear that if you just could move this telescope above the atmosphere, you wouldn't run into this problem. And, Astronomers even, as you probably know, have a, have a term for this effect where the, the star sort of moves around and gets blurred out and it's called seeing. So they talk, the astronomers talk a lot about how is the seeing at your sight? And that really means what, what resolution do you have when you're trying to observe something? And so uh, this is a big deal for, for telescopes on the ground. And this is why you put telescopes on tops of really tall mountains is there's less stuff between you and the star um, but if you can just go completely above the atmosphere, you can ignore this effect altogether. And it turns out this is really uh, one of the limiting things for ground-based telescopes. So um, in 1977, after a few decades of Spitzer and others really advocating for a big space telescope and showing that it would work, Congress decides to fund Hubble. Um, the estimated cost in 1977 was $300 million. So that's about a billion dollars in today's money. Um, and of course, as you know, Congress, once they make up their mind and fund something, it always happens very expediently. Um, so this is the, this is the timeline to Hubble's launch. So what you're seeing uh, on the bottom is what year it is. And what you're seeing on the, on the vertical axis is how many months to launch. And so here in 1977, Hubble was launched and it was about 82 months until it should launch. And so then they went along and they started building it and everything. And all of a sudden they reach uh, sort of mid 1980 and the shuttle that they needed to, to launch Hubble in caused a delay. And so now we're kicked back up and it's okay, instead of 40 months, it's back to 60 months. And you can see this kind of zigzag pattern persist and that's because there were all these sorts of delays. So originally Hubble was supposed to launch uh, in 1983 uh, but in fact, it didn't actually launch until 1990. And perhaps, you know, this isn't really a surprise. It's an incredibly complicated mission. Um, and so, you know, even with our best estimates, it can take a long time to execute these things. And I'll tell you a similar story about the James Webb Space Telescope later. Um, there were some, you know, there were some really sad parts of this story. For example, bullet five here is that the Challenger disaster happened right here. That's in um, 1986. And so this shut down the shuttle program because of the explosion of the Challenger. And so they really, you know, had to revisit the, the, the means of getting Hubble into space. Um, one of the other benefits, one of the benefits rather than the drawbacks 
was that the technology improved. And so as things are delayed, they actually could go in and upgrade the, the detectors and data storage. So for example, in the very original version of Hubble, Hubble was actually gonna record things on film. The film was going to be put into these lead line canisters and dropped back to earth and then retrieved by astronauts uh, in, in some sort of very complicated scheme. But in fact, by the time they could launch in 1990, they're able to wirelessly downlink the data to earth. So it really changed sort of what we were able to do with Hubble simply because we could do it uh, digitally like that. Um, I have a few pictures of Hubble in construction. So this is uh, Hubble being built. This is pre-launch, so like 1989, 1990, something like that. And you can see just for scale, there's a person down here in the lower left. Hubble is about the size of a school bus. It's something like 40 feet tall. Um, and so you can see it's, you know, it's something that's pretty sizable that you have to get into space. Here's another picture of Hubble's primary mirror, which is about 2.4 meters uh, in diameter. And so you can see these people who are working on checking the mirror for imperfections um, very carefully because this it takes a long, long time to grind and coat a mirror like this. Um, but you can, again, just get a sense of scale here. Uh, this is a 2.4. And, and a 2.4 meter telescope by today's standards is pretty typical. And at the time it was like modestly large, but then putting it in space really just amplified its effect because we got around this whole problem of, of seeing. Uh, so here's an article from, I believe the New York Times uh, in yeah, April 10th, 1990. And it was a big feature piece on Lyman Spitzer and his paper in 1946, his vision. Um, and this is more about, you know, it's sort of a detail piece on how he's feeling about it, but I want you to mostly pay attention to what's in on the left side here. Uh, these are the four science areas that Spitzer made the argument for, for Hubble. And, and the things that he thought Hubble could do that we couldn't do without are figure out what the extent of the universe is, understand the structure of galaxies, understand the structure of globular clusters, and, and discover the nature of other planets. And this was the strong science case that sold Congress on funding it and, and NASA on, on building it. And so we'll circle back to the, the success and, and, and maybe not success of some of these, um, but, but really this is a vision that started a long, long time ago. So this is um, the Space Shuttle Discovery on April 24th, 1990, uh, being launched, I believe from Cape Canaveral. Um, and you can see that, well, you can't see it, but Hubble is stored in this in this central um, cargo hold of, of Space Shuttle Discovery to be put into orbit. Uh, and the expectation was that within about a month or so, they would start being able to take data and we would see all these beautiful images and, and you know, had got underground all the ground tests and had really performed beautifully. Unfortunately, the first thing that made the news about Hubble was this. This is um, Time Magazine, July 9th, 1990. The Hubble telescope, star-crossed, NASA's $1.5 billion blunder. You'll also notice the cost has creeped up from the original $300 million that Congress allocated towards it. So, so Hubble immediately made the press for all the wrong reasons and that it didn't really work. Uh, even though it was in space and it was able to take data, it wasn't doing it very well. So uh, what's the problem? Well, here's the problem. If, if you look uh, at a star, so take this, this is an example of a star that you would see in space. Um, and you know, here's an example of the same star if you saw it from the ground and it's blurred out because of this effect called, called seeing due to atmospheric distortions. Um, okay, so this isn't great. And so Hubble was supposed to be able to see what's, what's going on in the, on the right hand. But that's not what it was seeing. In fact, this is what it was seeing. That same star had all these fringing patterns here. The light was being scattered all over the place. And in fact, you were losing roughly 85% of the light uh, of this star to off sort of off star you know, areas. And this was a huge problem because Hubble's whole purpose was to go up there and take really sharp images. And in fact, all you're seeing are these kind of blurred fringing patterns. Okay, so, so that's what it was seeing, and the question was why. And, and the reason is um, due to something called spherical aberration. And so the idea is that if you, if you have a mirror, so that's what these two um, kind of 
two B things are showing are, are, are in, um, graphics of mirrors, and the mirror is spherical, then it turns out that you can't actually focus light to the same point. It actually every little ray of light focuses at a slightly different point and you get a blurred image. And this is what was going on with Hubble is that in fact, they actually got the, the, the angle of the grinding wrong at like the fourth decimal place or fifth decimal place or something and made it very close to spherical. And so they couldn't focus the light. And what you really want is a parabolic shaped mirror. And so that actually focuses the light in a single point. And so the difference is this blurred image versus a sharp image. Um, so the question is what to do because you can't exactly go up in space and regrind the mirror. And the solution is that they basically did space optometry and gave Hubble a pair of glasses. Um, actually more technically, it's more like a contact lens, but basically they, they went in and they fixed the optics of Hubble um, by, by giving it what is it? I mean, it's obviously much more complicated, but really putting a big contact lens on it. Um, and so, you know, they, they didn't know that this would work at the time, but this is the kind of the, the so-called moonshot uh, is that they thought, all right, this is our best chance to salvage uh, Hubble. And so here are astronauts training um, in a big tank uh, at, at NASA headquarters on a, you know, on a mocked up version of Hubble as to how to actually do the repair. Um, and so you can, you know, this was a, a huge deal. And also they didn't want to leave in space very long. Hubble wasn't supposed to be a long-term mission. Um, even though it was repairable, it's kind of like a 10 year original mission, um, you know, so they really wanted to do this pretty quickly. So uh, in 1993, this is an image of an astronaut up there um, starting the repair on Hubble. So that it took them again from launch to actually getting back to Hubble to fix it about three years, which actually in terms of coming up with the solution, figuring that it should work and getting up there is pretty quick. Uh, here's a picture of the astronaut actually starting to undo the, the chamber that needed fixing. Um, the astronaut was quoted by saying their warranty was three years, labor not included. Uh, this, this spacewalk is known as servicing mission one, and this is 1993. Not only did they end up fixing Hubble, but it was in fact also the first human servicing mission of a major telescope. And so they <coughs> hoped but they didn't actually know it would work. Um, and so they really, really banked a lot on this and it turned out to work really well. Um, they thought that maybe the repairs would last for five years and that would be basically so set Hubble's lifetime. Um, and so they, they thought, all right, five, you know, five years would be great. And they had already been talking about James Webb at this point. And so they thought maybe, maybe five, maybe we can extend it and overlap with Webb, but that's about the best we think we can do. So, um, so they fixed Hubble, and this is showing you a picture of a, a galaxy M100. And on the left is the before picture. So this is the blurry picture that Hubble had been taking. And on the right is the after picture. So the contact lens, in fact, really did work and gave us the, the sharp image that, that we had been expecting the whole time. So after getting off to a slow start, Hubble really started to pick up some steam. Um, here's another really iconic image. This is the Eagle Nebula. This was taken with Hubble in 1995. And you can see this, this is a, a region in which young stars are born. And these are big pillars of, of cold molecular gas and stars are forming. You can see some of the radiation sort of near the tips of, of these pillars. And you know you can buy this on postcards. It's, it's one of the most iconic Hubble images ever taken. Uh, the good news is that, that Hubble is now working and we're in about 1993, 1994 and everyone is, is feeling a lot better. Um, so that wasn't the, the last time that Hubble got serviced, though they weren't sure that they would keep servicing it. They ended up doing it many, many times. So I described to you servicing mission one in 1993, but you can see in 97, 99, 2002, and 2009, there have been servicing missions. And in fact, servicing mission four in 2009 was the last time the astronauts went to Hubble. As you know, NASA retired the shuttle, pro shuttle program and they had no way of really getting up there. And that's sort of you know where SpaceX and other places come in now is that they're trying to provide rides to astronauts and, and figure this all out. Um, and, and basically the sum of all of these servicing missions are that they put on new instruments, they upgraded the batteries, 
they have these things called gyros that that move around and allow you to point Hubble. And those are probably those are some of the few mechanical pieces on Hubble, uh, and they they fail every you know five to seven years. And so the plan really was for Hubble to actually be deorbited in 2020. That is, they didn't think it would work this long after the last servicing mission. So it's been 12 years now, and Hubble is actually performing quite well. A uh, few gyros have died, but they are contractually obligated to safely deorbit it. The plan was to do it in 2020. Now they're talking it should last, they think, until like 2025, perhaps beyond. Um, it's slowly degrading because of radiation in space, but it's still performing uh, amazingly well. This um, image that I'm showing you here is called the Hubble Deep Field, and it was taken in 1995. And the idea was to basically take Hubble, point at the same seemingly blank spot of sky for several hundred hours and see what we could find. Uh, and so this was one of the, there were a few key goals of Hubble um, when it launched, and this was one of them to discover what the distant universe looked like. And that was, again, one of Spitzer's uh, original ideas. And in this, this image, there's actually 1500 galaxies of all sorts of ages. Some are sort of large and close by, others are smaller and further away uh, and, and, and exist at a time that was a, a long, long time ago. Um, but this was really, this image really changed the field of astronomy because it showed us for the first time that in fact there were galaxies in the very, very early universe. Up until this point, we weren't sure that that was true, but this is the first image that really confirmed that. Uh, so this was 1995. And then um, 10 years later, so 2005, Hubble took something called the ultra deep field. And uh, that's, that's what you're seeing here. This is with a different camera after a servicing mission upgrade. And the reason behind the Hubble Ultra Deep Field is that the Bush administration wasn't sure that Hubble was scientifically uh, making scientific progress anymore. That is, they weren't sure that there was, it was worth funding it to do more science, even though it was stable and up in space. And so the director of Space Telescope at the time says, ha, huh, I'll show you. And so they spent 500 hours staring at a different blank, blank patch of sky uh, to show that, in fact, there was even more out there than, than we previously knew. Um, and so in this patch of sky, which is really, really tiny, it's something like the size of a pin needle, if you were to hold up a pin needle or a pin head at, at arm's length, there, there are over 10,000 galaxies here. And many of them are even older than, than we thought at the time could have existed. And so it really just demonstrated to the community, demonstrated to Congress and the administration that there was a lot to do with Hubble still and that it needed the funding. And in fact, every year since this image um, was taken, Congress has funded Hubble at 100% or higher because they all have, you know, both publicly and privately seem to highly value it and that they put their money where their mouth is. So, so Hubble is doing quite well right now. What you're seeing, of course, in this image are all sorts of galaxies. Everything, almost everything here is galaxy. This, this little thing is a, a foreground star and you can tell by these like kind of spiky things sticking out. Those are saturation spikes on the camera, but everything else basically are these like spiral galaxies or these tiny little things that are in the very, very distant universe. Um, and so there's a lot of galaxies in the universe. We actually now believe there's something like 2 trillion galaxies in the universe. Um, and they appear like these, many of them appear like these fuzzy patches of light, but in fact, they're pretty complicated. So if we were to zoom in on our own galaxy and you know, close enough that we could we could see it in detail, but far enough that we can get the entire structure. Of course, this is just an artist rendering. You would see that there's a lot going on inside a galaxy. There's a you know very massive central region. There are these arm structures, and they have all sorts of different like substructure to them. These kind of pink areas are where stars are forming. These dark areas have dust, and there's just all sorts of complexity going on. Um, and so for every galaxy you saw in the previous image, you basically have this, it, it is this composite of, you know, hundreds of millions of stars and dust and all sorts of dynamics between the two that turn out to be really complicated. And in order to understand how those galaxies form, how they evolve, how they function, we really need to go to some galaxies and dissect them in great detail. And of course, the problem is that we live in our own Milky Way and you can't something in its entirety when you live inside of it. It's like trying to infer the properties of the outside of your house by looking at out a window. You might be able to get some information, but you're really missing the majority. And so 
it's this that motivated our study of Andromeda. So if you think back to the first slide, I showed you this beautiful picture of, of our neighboring galaxy M31. Well, this is really why we decided to study M31. It's the nearest big galaxy, which we could study in detail. And we did this by pointing Hubble at it for a really, really long time and tiling over a large area. And so I'm gonna tell you about that project. So um, this is a ground-based image of Andromeda. That's this kind of um, elliptical light towards the bottom of your screen. And we're gonna zoom in on it and we're gonna transition from this ground-based image to the Hubble-based image that we've put together. And there's gonna be a lot of panning and, and, and moving around. So if you're motion sick, you know, you may wanna, if you're sub susceptible to motion sickness, you may wanna look away for a moment. Um, but we're gonna zoom in and you'll see Andromeda appear in increasing levels of detail. You can see these dark, what we call astronomical dust lanes these bluer regions where there are younger stars that are just forming. You can see some bright red stars, some star clusters. And now we're just gonna pan through the disk of M31 just to show you that with Hubble, we can actually study a whole galaxy on a star-by-star -star basis. And so again, you can just see the diversity of colors and densities tell you that there's just a lot going on here in terms of the the formation of stars and evolution of the galaxy uh, in, in tremendous detail. And remember that essentially every galaxy in the universe has stellar populations that look not exactly like this, but some combination of things like red stars and blue stars, young stars, old stars, and, and dust and other things. And so we really want to be able to drill down into some galaxies to understand them in this detail. It's just that not many are close enough to do this. So. This survey of Andromeda um, is part of the pub is is called the Panchromatic Hubble Andromeda Treasury or the FAT program, um, and the idea was that we would take Hubble and tile over a large area of M31. Um, and, and the reason, just to reiterate what I said briefly, is that from the ground, so this little inset in the upper left, this is uh, an image of Andromeda taken from the from the ground. And this, this little green box is a region we zoomed in on and you can see that in the background. And even more so, this little cyan box is a really small star forming region in Andromeda taken from the ground. And you can see in the inset, there's all these blurry stars. And this has to do with the effect of seeing that I described earlier. And in the bottom image, this is the same region only seen with Hubble and these kind of blurry blue blobs resolve into these individual points, which are stars. And so we've gone from, okay, we can kind of guess at what's there to we know exactly what's there because Hubble is able to resolve it and tell us. And so this was the real motivation for, for pointing Hubble at Andromeda was to study galaxies in detail. And also we knew that Hubble could do, um, could do the job. So just some, some basic details about, about FAT. Uh, the unit of time that is used with Hubble is called an orbit. Remember, it's geosynchronously orbiting the, the Earth, and that's how they award times is how many orbits you get to point Hubble at something. An uh, in, in orbit, eight, so we were given 828 orbits, and this is by far the largest Hubble program that's ever been undertaken. And the typical program gets like two orbits or something like that. So this is absolutely uh, enormous. Um, 828 orbits is something like 75,000 minutes, which is something like 50, 24 hour days. And we did these observations spread out over four years. Um, the, this bottom panel um, is basically showing you the wavelengths at which we observe. So different stars peak at different wavelengths. So this in the bottom panel, this is the flux of our sun. So how much radiation we receive on earth at particular wavelengths. Uh, and it peaks, as you know, it peaks in the green because this is why plants are green. Um, and, and so there's this green filter on Hubble, but we also imaged uh, M31 in ultraviolet, which again is blocked by our atmosphere and these other infrared filters because there are a lot of red stars out there. And, and so we could sample them as well. And so we did this, this whole panchromatic survey at six different wavelengths. Um, so some, some things about the actual uh, observation. So this is a, a different image of Hubble or of M31, not taken with Hubble, but with a, a different space telescope. Um, just to give you a sense of how big Andromeda is in the sky, this is the, the moon. The moon is about half a degree across. So kind of like 
you know, if you hold your 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 fist up, that's about uh, the size of a moon. Um, and and this little box, I think I put, yeah, here's a, a red box I put around it. That's the size of one HST field. So you can see that Andromeda is several moons across in terms of its size, and Hubble is this this really really tall small box uh, on the moon. Um, and so it would take many, many Hubble pointings to tile lots of Andromeda. So we said, well, we don't really need to tile all of it. We really need to tile like a good fraction of it to understand what's going on. So we picked this sort of upper quadrant. So we're gonna zoom in on that part. And this pink outline are all the, is, is the survey area. So we cover everything from the central region, which is called the nucleus, all the way out to the edge of the star forming disk. Um, and there's a really complex observational pattern here that I'll, I'll try to break down for you, but I'm of course happy to answer questions about it. So, so each one of these units, these blue things is called what we call a brick. And a brick is composed of, of many individual Hubble pointings. So we'll zoom in on one and I'll just describe the process to you. So in fact, Hubble has um, three cameras on it. Two of them are, are next to each other and one is different part of the sky. So you can actually, point them both at the same time. And so one of these little fields you can sort of make out here, that's one Hubble field. And so one of these bricks that we have is six by three Hubble fields. And then while you're observing in this particular camera, you turn on the other camera and that's observing some number of arc minutes away. So you're getting two non-overlapping um, um, pointings at the same time, and they sample different wavelengths. And so you, you really need to tile everything um, with the same cameras. And so it led to this very complicated scheme where we'd observe what like this, this kind of three by three tiling. And then in parallel, we get this other sort of complicated pattern. And then every six months you would flip them. And, and that's basically, we just tiled our way through all um, of these bricks and there's 23 of them over a four year period by flipping the, the telescope every six months. Uh, this was a really, really complicated strategy to come up with because Hubble really wasn't designed to do this kind of mapping. I mean, it worked out really well, but it, it took you know a good year of our lives just to figure out how to do the survey in the first place. Um, the results, so going back to the image you saw is that we have measurements of the brightnesses for 117 million stars in Andromeda, making it one of the largest stellar catalogs uh, in existence, and uh, by cer certainly the largest uh, in any very nearby galaxy. And so this is the survey. And so you know, I want to describe some of the science that came out of the survey because we didn't do this just to take a pretty picture of Andromeda, though it is really nice. They never would have given us the time just to make a picture, so they actually wanted to know like what we would learn. So some of the things that we learned. Um, one is that we know from other telescopes where Andromeda is currently forming stars. Really young stars are hot. They emit a lot of ultraviolet light. And this is the, the blue you can see in this image. Uh, they also uh, radiate dust around them. There's this like space dust that gets created when stars form and it, th that's much cooler. And so that, that emits in the infrared. And so if you take these, um, in ultraviolet and, and, and infrared um, um, images and you combine them, you can get a sense of where the stars are forming now in Andromeda. And that's this kind of really cool spiral pattern you can see here, this, these rings basically. But the problem is we don't really know. So we know that this is a snapshot now, but what about what happened in the past? Like have these rings been there and there's a lot tied to galaxy dynamics and galaxy formation that sort of depend on on how these, these properties change over time. And it turns out that the Hubble observations uh, allow us to actually trace the structure of things like these rings over time. So um, the way this works without getting into a lot of detail, or that if this is a, in the background is a Hubble image of, of Andromeda, it's sort of zoomed in. And if you look at these two different regions, there's a green box and a blue box, they just look different. There are more blue stars in this region and more red stars in that region. And it turns out that if you measure the brightnesses of the individual stars in these regions and compare them to models, and you know this involves a fair amount of physics and math, um, you can actually make maps of when stars formed in the past. So you're not just restricted to where they're forming now, but you can actually trace them back uh, over, over cosmic time. So um, 
this is where stars are forming now and we have this nice kind of ring structure. Uh, and this, this is a reconstruction based on Hubble's imaging of where stars were forming half a billion years ago. So we're talking about sort of the times where dinosaurs roamed the earth. And what you can see are that Andromeda's main star forming rings actually were there when the dinosaurs were around, so half a billion years ago. And this is really was a surprising result because the people who do galactic dynamics, like how galaxies should, should, should work, they didn't think things like this should persist for so long. They thought these are really transient phenomena. These, these rings should just be gone in a very short amount of time. And it turns out that that's not true. And so we don't still understand why these rings persist for so long, but Hubble was the first and, the, and our program was the first to show in fact that they do. Um, so this was a really interesting result that people are still trying to digest and figure out what exactly is going on, but it's really changed our picture of, of, the, of how galaxies form and evolve. Um, another area that, that we've made tremendous progress uh, are beyond just stars. So in Andromeda, we see other things. We see star forming regions. So that's what this green arrow is pointing to. We see dust lanes. So you can see this kind of diffuse feature that goes across your screen and that's due to dust formed uh, in the process of star formation and um, tends to obscure light. We see globular clusters. So these are these very compact clusters that formed in the very early universe. So there's like a million stars in a very, very small volume um, and they're very old. There are young star clusters, so things that are just forming today. So groups of stars that are just formed today and there's much, much more. And so the idea is that not only could we do stuff with the individual stars, but we could learn a lot about just the other constituents of a galaxy. The problem is that finding these things turned out to be quite challenging. The original plan was to have members of our team, the FAT team, go through by eye and find all these interesting features. And so we found eight experts who are really good at doing this and we said, go. And basically they got through about a quarter of the data and it took several months and they were exhausted and they couldn't look at more images because their eyes hurt. And they just said, this is not gonna work. We have to come up with something else. And so we ended up coming up, we ended up pairing with this project called Zooniverse. You may have heard of it, um, but Zooniverse is a citizen science project. That is you can put a science program on the web that has like very clear defined goals and ask people from around the world to participate and help say classify things or find things or you know tell you whether other things are similar or group them together. And so this led to the birth of something called the Andromeda Project. And this is a screenshot of the website with the Andromeda Project. So we display you know, image like this, you could log in from anywhere in the world and you'd see this kind of image and you would tell us if you think there's a star cluster or a galaxy, is it some other like artifact in an image? And you would then go in and you could circle things. Uh, and it really it was a pretty cool thing. And the Zooniverse team uh, has been doing this a long time. And so we, we paired with them to help us sift through this, you know, gigantic amount of data on Andromeda. And so it took us like you know, many, many months to get through some fraction of the data with our internal experts. Uh, well, with the help of Zooniverse, we actually got 1.8 million classifications. That is people classified 1.8 million different things in all of the Andromeda image in just 25 days. So it was just absolutely incredible. We had so many people participate and it went, you know, we thought it would take just a couple of months and we didn't know that so many people would be interested. But, but we really just did, uh, people really, really were, found this very cool. Um, it turned out that 30,000 people logged in, 30,000 people logged in to do this from all over the world. So here's a map just showing you basically every continent is covered except for Antarctica uh, and people from all over the world classified stuff. It's very cool. One person in fact actually classified every image, everything in a one 24 hour period. They're from, from Kansas and you know, it was incredible. We thought, you know, there's no way they could have done a good job, but it turns out we put all these kind of hidden things in the images to test people's accuracy. And this person did an incredible job. I mean, I don't, I can't imagine doing that for 24 hours straight. Um, people really love this. Uh, you can see some of the comments we got, uh, some of the feedback, really excited, uh, dope stuff. So we were really excited that the uh, citizen scientists really liked this project. Um, 
And this is an animation showing basically a composite of the citizen science results. All these white circles are things that people circled on their screen to indicate what they thought the size of the object was. And the green circles are things that they thought were not objects. And so basically this is, you know, like a time lapse of, of how it worked in practice. Uh, and we were of course just blown away by, by the citizen scientists across the globe really pitching in. So uh, at the end of the day, uh, some of the things to come out of this were a catalog of star clusters. And so overlaid on this image of Andromeda are the 2,700 star clusters that our citizen scientists identified. So that's pretty cool. It's the largest star, ca star cluster catalog in existence. They also found another 2,200 ba background galaxies. So these are galaxies that are in some part of the distant universe, but you could see them through the disk of Andromeda just by sort of a chance alignment. And so they found 2,200 of these and they're useful for other types of science that I won't talk about today. So uh, this resulted in six times more star clusters than had previously been known. So this plot is showing the number of star clusters as a function of how bright they are. So on the left, you can see in the previous catalogs shown in red, uh, you know, there were some star clusters known, um, but as you go to, to, to um, fainter star clusters, this black curve shows that fat really outperformed what we were able to do previously. And so we really got down into the weeds of the star clusters uh, in Andromeda. And you know, really we know all galaxies have them. They're just so, so hard to see. And so it was amazing that we can even do this in a galaxy like Andromeda. Um, just to give you a little bit of eye candy, this is from a press release we made uh, with NASA. If you zoom in on this, white box in our fat region, you would see, you'll see this in the lower left-hand corner. So all this kind of structure, this blue area where all these young stars are forming and every little white box is a star cluster. And these six cutouts to the right are actual Hubble images from our survey of all these star clusters. And so you can see these are regions where all sorts of young stars uh, are, are forming today. So. Very, very cool. I mean, again, this level of detail is something that we just hadn't had before. One of the things we learned from this process is that um, you can go in, you find these star clusters, and then you count how many stars are in each of them. And star formation theory tells you how many there should be. And we've sort of calibrated this number in the Milky Way, our own galaxy. And we went in and did this in Andromeda, and we found out, in fact, that M31 has 25% fewer massive stars than is predicted based on our understanding of the Milky Way. And this is um, really surprising. We didn't really expect to find this, but it has a lot of implications because massive stars are the things that explode. They cause supernova, they inject metals, the, the stuff, you know, we're made of star stuff from these exploding massive stars. But if you have fewer of them, that really actually changes the composition of different elements and, and, and chemical um, properties. And so, that M31 has fewer um, than we were expecting was, was really a surprise. And so this is also something that we're working on understanding from a theoretical side. One of the last things I'll describe is mapping Andromeda's dust. And so this is a little technical, but, but bear with me. Um, what you're seeing here is a plot of a star's temperature versus its luminosity and in these, this red streak is basically uh, a, a set of stars in Andromeda. And they, they span a huge range of luminosity, but a really narrow range of temperature. And so uh, they're really excellent stellar thermometers. And the idea is that if you have these things that are really good at telling you temperature and you go and you, you look and then you see that there's an offset. And so if you look in the right-hand panel, there's one streak here and another streak here that's telling you that they're two different temperatures, even though they're, they, should, they should have identical temperatures, they don't. It turns out what can cause this to happen is the presence of this stuff called dust, which I mentioned earlier. And it basically takes some of the light out of the picture. And so the idea is that this kind of narrow streak here are stars that are closer to us than the dust. And these stars on the, the right streak are behind the dust. And so it turns out that by measuring the difference in, in the temperatures of these streaks, you can figure out how much dust there was. And, um, that ended up with this really interesting map of dust in Andromeda. And so you can see all this really fine scale structure of all this sort of cosmic dust. And, and this is for many people, myself included, 
dust is is sort of a nuisance, um, but to have such a such a really detailed map of it actually gave us a really good idea of how to correct for it when we're trying to figure out the properties of stars in other galaxies. And so this is, in fact, the largest, most detailed dust map we have of a galaxy outside our Milky Way. So, um, you know, those are some of the things we learned from FAT. And I want to circle back to the, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field image I showed you earlier because, you know, there's 10,000 galaxies in here. And, and some things to take away are one, you know, galaxies are complicated that their star formation is, is variable in space and time, like in Andromeda, this is just one galaxy. It has these ring structures that we don't know how they got there and why they lasted so long. And you know, there's trillions of galaxies out there that have their own story. Uh, we learned that, that, that M31 has fewer massive stars. And so this raises questions, are things that we learn in the Milky Way really applicable to all other galaxies when our, our neighboring galaxy already shows something different? And, and there's lots of messy dust. And, and so again, we can do these very detailed studies in M31, but it, and, and we have to take those lessons and apply them elsewhere because we just can't do this type of detailed study uh, for many of the galaxies, for any of the galaxies you see in this background image. So that's sort of where we are today. And I wanna now just conclude by talking about what's next. Um, so what's next? Well, one of the things uh, we're doing is we're doing the same type of Hubble survey of something called the Triangulum Galaxy. So there's a companion to Andromeda called the Triangulum. And um, we're doing another sort of um, tiling of it with Hubble. And so this image is showing the, the Milky Way. So that's this really big, beautiful, prominent thing in the foreground. And this little speck here is Andromeda. So that's what I've been talking about. And then there's a tiny little speck next to it that you can't see that's the Triangulum. And so we're gonna zoom in and show you some pretty fresh off the presses data of the Triangulum Galaxy as we've seen it with Hubble. So here we go, we're gonna zoom in and zoom in, there we go. So you can sort of start to see the Triangulum appear in the center of your screen. And what Hubble lets us do is just keep zooming in and keep getting increasing, increasing amounts of detail. So here is still a ground-based image, now we're trans, transitioning to a space-based image and we're gonna zoom in more. And we're gonna see, now we're gonna go into the Hubble image where you can see a tremendous amount of detail about the triangulum. And so we're gonna zoom through the triangulum and resolve it into these individual stars with Hubble. And so this is what we're doing currently with Hubble is doing a survey of this galaxy, the triangulum and using something similar uh, to the Andromeda project where we had citizen scientists find star clusters in M31 or the Andromeda galaxy, we did the same thing in the Triangulum. And so you can see all these blue dots are um, star clusters. There's 1300 star clusters that we've discovered in the Triangulum. And so this is a fairly new project. So this is where we are right now, but we're also gonna ask questions about what the dust, what the number of massive stars are and just try to understand what the variation in these properties are as you change galaxy type. So that's what's going on with Hubble. And now um, I can tell you a little bit about uh, the James Webb Space Telescope. So James Webb is, is billed as the replacement to Hubble. And this is a, a picture of one of the technicians standing in front of Webb. Uh, you can see if, if you have been following it in the news, you'll, you'll notice this is the very iconic uh, mirror pattern, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, Webb, unlike Hubble, Hubble has an aluminum coated mirror. Webb's is coated with gold, so it actually is yellow like this. So um, this is a, a comparison of different types of teles space telescopes and their sizes. So I've been talking to you about Hubble. Hubble um, is roughly the size of a school bus. This is the Webb telescope. It's roughly the size of a tennis court. Um, and so you can just get a sense of, I'll, I'll show you some of this in, in more detail in a moment, but basically Webb has this big sun shield here that is gonna expand and keep, it's in, primarily operates in the infrared and needs to be cool. And so they had to put the shield to keep the solar radiation off of the telescope. And that's what you're seeing here. And it unfurls to be something like the size of a tennis court. Uh, we've been taught, you know, I showed you a picture earlier of Hubble's mirror. So this is about 2.4 meters. Uh, this is the scale, this is the size of a person, and this is the Webb telescope, which is going to be six and a half meters in diameter, so, so substantially larger, and you can see it's actually this really um, 
crazy segmented mirror. And that's because it actually has to fold up and fit inside of the telescope. And it's going to be really scary because they have to unfold it in space. Um, some things about Webb. Um, so Hubble is in this geosynchronous orbit. So it follows more or less this kind of blue trajectory around Earth. Uh, the moon is about 380,000 kilometers away. Webb is going to be launched way out here. It's what's called a Lagrange point. And it's a gravitational stability in the solar system. Um, and so it can orbit even though there's nothing, like there's no planet here or anything, but it's gonna be out there at a million miles. So it is unlike Hubble, not serviceable. Uh, so it had better work. One of the scary things about Webb is it's so big, it doesn't fit into any of the current rocket configurations. So they had to design it to fold up and then it has to go do like an 800 point unfurling maneuver in space. Uh, and so this is, you know, I'm glad I'm not a technician who's worked on this my entire life because those, you know, 10 minutes it takes to unfurl or whatever are, you know, going to be really scary. So just to give you a sense of, this is a, an artist's conception of what Webb is going to have to do once it gets out to the million mile point from Earth. So you can see it's going to start to have to unfold itself. It has to get the mirrors out there. And then it's going to have to unfurl this big sun shield. And these little pieces of the sun shield are only about half a millimeter thick. And there's five of them that require very delicate spacing. And so it's just kind of yanking itself um, into configuration here. makes itself taut, and then it's gonna have to unfold the mirrors um, so it can have the, the full area. And so you can imagine, of course, all the number of things that could go wrong with this. Um, there's been, of course, a lot of work that's gone into web. So here we go, there we go, there's the deployment of the primary mirror. So this is what it should look like in the end, but there's, you know, like 800 things that has to do right in order for this to happen. So, you know, I'm not trying to be pessimistic, but you can imagine, you know, it causes a little bit of anxiety when you think about, you know, when things goes wrong, you can't just fly someone up there and fix it. Um, Webb, of course, has been in the news for all the wrong reasons over the last decade. Uh, Nature ran this piece in 2010 the telescope that ate astronomy. Uh, so the issue was that Webb was originally supposed to launch in 2011 and now it's 2021 and it's finally launching. And so it's you know roughly a few billion dollars over budget and 10 years late. So if you think back to the timeline I shared with you for Hubble, it's actually basically on track with, with what Hubble had done, although for very different reasons. Uh, Webb had a lot of technical challenges that were I think controllable, but with, with you know, Hubble, the, you know, problems with the shuttle were not, were, had nothing to do with the telescope itself. However, uh, in the last two years, they've made tremendous progress and the launch date is now fixed. It's going to be October 31st, 2021. So when you're out for Halloween this year, uh, you can think about James Webb unfolding itself in space uh, as a trick and a treat, I guess, at the same time. Um, as was mentioned in the beginning, I'm the principal investigator of one of the first programs that will be observed with James Webb. So there was this idea to create something called early release science programs. And Webb is, is different than Hubble. It's in the infrared and has to stay cool. And so that requires um, coolant in, in the telescope. Uh, it also requires uh, propellant since it's kind of in a different type of orbit. You can't just like go ref refuel it. And, and there's just a lot of technical things that are much different about Webb um, that give it a limited lifetime. So it really is only supposed to last about five years, 10 if we're lucky is what they tell us. And so NASA crafted this thing uh, called the Early Science Release Program with the idea that we would take a wide range of observations uh, that cover what they think scientists would use Webb for very early on. And we would sort of prototype these kind of analysis tools um, for the general community. And so uh, basically the idea was to obtain images and spectroscopy that would demonstrate the key modes of JWST. Uh, this would be done very early in the lifetime and we're supposed to provide the tools and example data for everyone to propose in the second cycle of JWST. And that will happen 
in November 2022. So basically between launch and October 2021, um, web will commission for six months, it will take our data, then we have about five months to scramble and get all the data together and you know present it to the community in some usable way. Um, and so this all happened in 2017, because the original launch date was 2018. So uh, they solicited stuff in mid 2017. Um, <clears throat> and there were 115 programs, and of these, 13 were selected for execution. They span a broad range of areas from solar system science to stellar physics to black holes and these other areas. Um, so 13 programs for 500 hours were selected, and incredibly, two from Berkeley were selected, one by myself on stellar populations and the other by Imke de Pater, who's a professor emeritus on solar system. And so we are, in fact, the only institution that has two early release science, science programs at JWST. So uh, I can't tell you more about ERS because we're still waiting for the telescope to launch, but I'm happy to talk about uh, some, you know, answer questions about the program. I just want to, in the last minute, um, tell you a little bit about what's going on in the astronomical community right now because it's very relevant to everything I've told you about. Uh, right now, every, every 10 years, astronomy uh, throughout the U.S. goes through something called the decadal survey process, where we all get together and, you know, a bunch of committees and everything and come up with ideas for the next decade of ast astronomy, astrophysics. And so um, Webb was actually recommended in the 1990 decadal, and now it's only being executed in, in 2020. And so there's a lot of long range planning going on. So people are now thinking about what should we be doing? when Webb's time is up or what should the next big project be? And so <clears throat> the big thing being proposed is something called the High Definition Space Telescope. Um, and the idea is that we had Hubble at a 2.4 diameter mirror, James Webb at 6.4 meters, and this new generation of telescope would be about a 12 meter diameter mirror. And essentially what this would do is allow us to resolve almost any galaxy in the universe with similar detail to what we've done in Andromeda. Any galaxy, so any of the two trillion galaxies at, at a level of detail similar to Andromeda. And so that's one of the, the main science drivers for this, this next generation large telescope. And another is that it'll actually be able to detect biosignatures of life on other planets. And so this is one of the ideas being considered the, Results of the decadal, the this, this survey started um, about two years ago, are supposed to be out sometime this summer. And so we'll learn what is going to be recommended um, for funding to Congress. And this is, I think, one of the most exciting things on that list. So just to conclude and circle back to the beginning, 1946, Lyman Spitzer is a professor at Princeton, writes this paper that says we should put a telescope in space for these reasons. And the scientific reasons are that we want to understand the extent of the universe, the structure of galaxies, the structure of globular clusters, and the nature of other planets. And Hubble has done all of those things. And we have now gotten a taste of what each of these things are. We know that there are thousands of other planets. We know a lot about globular clusters and galaxies. But now imagine if we launch something like a high definition space telescope and we can see all of this in detail, we can tell if there's life on other planets. You know, we'll really realize these visions, and it's you know a testament to, to Lyman Spitzer that he thought about this, you know, 70 years ago. Um, I will stop here and take any of your questions. Thank you very much. How would it detect biosignatures? What exactly would it do? Um, so what it would do is it would take, um, it would measure the spectrum, so it's flux as a function of wavelength of other planets' atmospheres. And there are certain types of, uh, for example, oxygen and methane and carbon dioxide compounds that are theoretically only produced by life similar to that on Earth. Doesn't mean it is necessarily human, but, but that it would be sort of carbon-based form of life. What have you learned, if anything, about the uh, the black hole at the center of Andromeda? Well, we actually, we think it's the result of a merger of at least two really big galaxies. So it's much bigger than the one that's in the center of the Milky Way. And it appears that the nucleus is at least a double, if not triple nucleus, um, which is 
really cool because we know that this should happen, but to have our neighboring galaxy have a couple different nuclei tells us that the black hole is being fed pretty substantially through galaxy mergers. Um, in detail, it's hard to say more just because, you know, the black hole is really small and even Hubble can't see it. Um, but that it's being fed through mergers uh, is a big confirmation of, of some theory. Thank you. Uh, this is Ken Lum. I just have a question. Uh, your, uh, the process by which you're processing the data from uh, the FAT program, uh, even, mm -hmm. with the, even with the help of Zooniverse, is taking yeah. an enormous amount of time. And so obviously yeah. you must be looking at automated ways of doing the same thing a whole lot faster. And I was just kind of wondering what the, that uh, aspect of things uh, looks like. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the, the program took four years to observe, the data took about two years to reduce, and that's done. What's taking a long time is actually interpreting the results. So there's a number of papers out that are showing, you know, we observe this ring in Andromeda and it's long lived. And now what it's doing is it's taking a lot of brain power from the theorist to sit there and try to understand why this is actually happening. So I think on the automation side for the data, we're doing okay, but the results have been so unexpected that we now have to kind of go back to square one and scratch our heads and say, well, why are we actually seeing this? And you know, the process for discovery and thinking about things is obviously hard to automate, but it, take, it can take quite a bit of time. Uh, so you can, the, I'm sorry. Uh, go ahead, Ken. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so you're, so you're working out uh, some uh, different uh, data processing mechanisms to try and uh, may speed up uh, this process, I, I assume, somewhere out there. Yeah, that, that, that's right. I mean, we're always looking for ways to make the whole process faster. And, and especially with James Webb, since it's going to produce so much more data, we, we will oh. definitely need to be more efficient. All right. OK. Uh, so the Hubble telescope was or the planning for the Hubble telescope and so forth, presumably took place uh, long before your career started. Yes. And, and uh, I guess it was online for quite a few years before you actually uh, came up through the system. I presume, yeah. I, I actually don't know precisely when your use of the data came out of that. But mm -hmm. I, I, I presume that to a large extent is is the development of astronomy and your interest and so forth were determined to a large extent by the so-called infrastructure that was decided on by the uh, decadal decisions made by the, the decision makers that uh, sort of decided to fund and, and, and build the uh, Hubble telescope in the uh, uh, 70s or 80s, I, I mm -hmm. guess. Now, yep. you said with respect to the James Webb Telescope uh, that it was the, the project that ate astronomy. Yes. Uh, and, and I was wondering if you could make some comments about whether that is a tongue-in-cheek comment. And if James Webb had not been done, is what alternatives would have been uh, funded instead? And would that have changed dramatically how astronomy would have developed and how people thought, because obviously different areas would have been uh, investigated and the tools for different areas would have gone forward. Yeah, that's, I mean, you have a very astute observation and an excellent question. The, the issue with James Webb, it was not a tongue in cheek comment that it, that it almost, that it ate astronomy. I mean, there was very serious concern that Congress would no longer fund big astronomy missions uh, after James Webb, the debacle, basically. I mean, it. the problems with James Webb, James Webb, unlike Hubble, were sort of self-inflicted. They had um, problems that were preventable. Uh, the wrong, say, solutions were used to clean parts of it that ended up disintegrating O-rings. I mean, things that were very sort of um, just, just flawed. And then there were other things that were less controllable, but, but the sum was that there was a la lack of confidence for a long time in the ability of NASA and the ability of the, the actual contractors to even build the telescopes. 
And, and so this led to Congress saying, why should we pour more money into this if we don't have confidence in you building it? And so it took a lot of effort uh, to, to rectify these problems and then convince Congress ultimately to complete the funding. In terms of, you know, and so, so this is where, you know, I'd say it, it did at some point seem to eat astronomy because the feeling was that if it didn't work and the feeling sort of is if it doesn't work, like it gets out there and gets stuck and doesn't unfold, Congress will be reluctant to fund any priorities laid out by the current decadal. Now, the thing about the American budget system, which you know many of you probably know, is that if you don't ask for it, you don't get it. In Europe, where they do, they have a very different scheme. They plan like 20 years ahead and they allocate this money and, and like it's very organized, but they don't shoot for really big things. In the US, if you don't ask for a big space telescope, Congress is never gonna think about funding it. So um, the alternatives to Webb proposed in 19, there, were, there was nothing, it was kind of Webb or bust. Um, and then there were a bunch of smaller things. And the idea was that finding the first galaxies, which is really what Webb is designed to do, was the most pressing question of the 90s, 2000s. And we still actually haven't done it today because only Webb can do that. That's, that's why it's being built. Um, so it wasn't, it's not clear to me that there was uh, a, an, an alternative path that could have been taken or that another option was being considered. If we hadn't asked for Webb, it's, you know, Congress would have said, okay, fine, we'll use the money for something else. They wouldn't have just given it to astronomy for other things. Um, and so with the current decadal, um, the big selling point is the detection of biosignatures and similar things and exoplanets uh, and planet, uh, you know, planets outside our solar system. Um, and that's something that we've gotten feedback that Congress is very excited about. And so it's these really key science drivers that really push the US to do these large missions. Um, there are alternatives being pitched to, to this large space telescope I told you about, but I don't think any of them are as compelling or answering such a fundamental question. I mean, I would say probably the discovery of life on another planet might be the most significant science discovery ever. And so telling Congress that they get really excited and then they'll, they'll you know, at least consider funding it. Whereas if we pitch more modest things, they're less likely to be interested and they can say, well, we have other things we'd rather do with the money. So it's a really, you know, it's a really great question. And, and you know, we could talk for a long time about strategy and, and in terms of funding these kind of things. So obviously you believe in it's to some extent true that there isn't a, concept that the dollars that go to astronomy would perhaps instead go to earth sciences or to any other science program, it would probably get frittered away uh, in the uh, next Iraq, Libya, you know, whatever deb debacle, uh, the, the political idiots uh, would probably go to rather than uh, actually uh, use uh, that funding to deal with, with technical issues of, of society per se. Yep. Yeah, it's the one thing that I've, I, you know, I, I've been in the field almost 20 years, but people who are far more experienced than me have shared this, that if you don't ask for it, they, they will not just give you the money. They will not put it somewhere else. You just don't get it. Uh, yes, yes, okay. Then, then um, I ask you is, uh, so as you sort of said, is you're, you're 20 years down or, or sort of 20 years into your career, is yeah. if you're sitting here today advising where the uh, next quasi-geek person who's wanting to go into uh, science in general or, or however you want to define that, would you still think that astronomy is as uh, attractive and interesting and so forth as what attracted you into it? Or are there some other opportunities that you see that are uh, similarly interesting or that you think have uh, enormous potential that you think if you were sort of starting today, where you might be headed? That's a, another great question. Astronomy in to some large degree, and this is, I'll paint with a broad brush here, uh, it is, is in many senses sort of merging with data science. That is, you have you know, people with specific astrophysical understanding of how the universe works, but they also need a lot of the skills to query large complex data sets because we have 
I mean, with James Webb, with, I mean, other telescopes on the ground that I haven't talked about today, we're talking about petabytes of data that are going to come in that are going to tell us all this stuff about the universe. And so I think that I would encourage people with interest in astronomy to go into it. But I would also say that the technical skills that you need to have now are even very different than, than 20 years ago when I started um, in that the, the sort of base level data science, data engineering, um, really just being comfortable working with large and, and, and challenging data sets that maybe you're not taking, you're, you know, you may not go to the telescope yourself anymore, but someone's producing this data is, is super important. And so I would encourage people to go and think about the, the data side as well as the astrophysics side. I think it's going to be decades before we really understand exoplanets and, and other things like this. So I think there's a lot left to do on the astronomy side. And additionally, I would say that we're becoming an increasingly global environment science-wise. I mean, NASA and the Canadian Space Agency and European Space Agency and China, to some extent, are having to collaborate on ever larger missions. And so having an understanding of the global relations is going to be important, too. And so that's you know, sort of this tie between science, data, and I think an understanding of international policy is, is what I would tell people um, going forward. I think for the club to look into uh, getting involved with some of these political organizations, organizing maybe other clubs and other voters across the country to push some of the initiatives that are in the decade or so. Maybe that's something the club talks about at some point. Yeah, I would recommend, I mean, the decadal is, you know, I mean, it's supposedly a month away or something like this from coming out. If, if you know, I would certainly encourage your members to, to read it. It's really, really interesting stuff. We have a question in chat here um, from Jim yeah. uh, that, are there any other distinctions between the Milky Way and Andromeda than those you mentioned? Mm -hmm. He's talking about the, the star uh, formation size and things. And are there hypotheses regarding these or both of the, the ones you've mentioned earlier? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I could probably give you a whole separate talk. In fact, I have a whole separate talk on the distinctions between Andromeda and the Milky Way. There are a lot. Um, we'll sign you up for that. <laughs> All right, I'd be happy to. Um, the, the biggest ones I can tell you about are that uh, we think Andromeda is a more evolved galaxy. That is, it is not, there aren't as many young stars. It's probably had a bunch of big systems collide into it where the Milky Way hasn't. Um, it has more dark matter than the Milky Way. It has a bigger black hole and a different type of nuclear structure. I mean, th there's a long list of these things. So, so yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of reasons, but we also think more galaxies in the universe are like Andromeda, or at least more big galaxies are like Andromeda than they are the Milky Way from, from what we know. And so it's unclear if we should take conclusions from the Milky Way and impose them on other galaxies, or if it would be smarter to, you know, take conclusions from Andromeda and impose those on other galaxies where we can't study them in detail, or if we, you know, maybe need to spend more time just making sure that the differences are real. Um, but yeah, there, there are some fairly substantial differences between the two systems. And then uh, my question is, uh, how, how are you able to get funding or, or thing for 800 and something odd rotations off the Hubble? Um, yeah. That seems like a, a very convincing paper. <laughs> well, um, first I should say thank you to everyone on the call because it's funded by the taxpayers. In the logistics of it are that when you get time on Hubble, it was, so, so when, when Hubble was created, they created a model where every time you got data, you also got funding to analyze the data because they didn't want people to just take data and not do anything with it. It was too expensive. Um, and, and, and they really wanted a lot to come out of it. So they incentivized us. And so when we were awarded the 800 orbits, we were awarded a lot of money to go with it that allowed us to do all the analysis. Without the money, not, you know, we wouldn't have been able to hire people to do it. So. Um, so it really is a structure that's designed to, to produce science because it allow, it provides funding with it. Uh, when I ask you a, a question about the, the department there at Berkeley, <clears throat> astronomy sure. department, how much involvement in these sorts of projects are undergraduates uh, given an opportunity to get into this stuff? 
And then mm. sort of uh, along the same lines or, or you know, uh, with respect to distributions and stuff is, are, are most of your graduate students uh, coming from the United States or are, are you getting a, a, a large number of foreign graduate students? And if so, is where does representation mostly come from? Yeah, great questions. Um, so the undergraduate question first, uh, the answer is undergraduates are really involved in research. I will speak from experience. I was an undergrad at Cal like 22 years ago and I was doing astronomy undergrad research and that's how I got into it. But, uh, so not only is you know that my path, but also one that I advocate for a lot and our department is really good at doing. Um, as of last count, we had 97 astronomy majors. So it's the largest astro uh, undergraduate program in the country. For the graduate side, um, the situation is that we get a lot of, so we get a lot of international applicants. The way that Berkeley, I mean, this is well above my pay grade is set up or that international students cost more for us than, than domestic students. And so we don't admit as many because we can't afford to have them all in the department. Uh, we have a, an applic applicant pool that largely comes from Southeast Asia so India, China, Japan, Korea. Um, but really out of the students we admit every year, like maybe we can take one international student. So like, I don't know, 10% of the incoming class can be international. And what programs are you competing with for, uh, for graduate students? Are, are they Harvard, uh, Caltech? Uh... Uh, Harvard, Caltech, Princeton, and MIT are probably our main competitors. Yeah, you'll okay. notice we're the, we're the only public school there. Is there a reason for that? Uh, that we're the only public school? Yeah, I mean, is, is there something weird about uh, public schools that they just can't afford to support uh, this sort of a department or something? Or, or, or is there... Oh, uh, well, so, so there are, in fact, um, I want to say probably 50 to 70 public universities in the U.S. have astronomy programs. But... Um, one is that, you know, Berkeley has a storied history in the sciences and astronomy. We were one of the first astronomy departments in the country. I think it was like, you know, founded in the 1880s and had one of the largest telescopes in the world for, you know, the night for much of the 19th, all the 19th and half of the 20th century. And so just by virtue of like building up reputation um, and donors and everything, um, it really helped the reputation of the department. And then of course the university when they have top departments, invest back in those departments. Um, whereas other schools started later and they may have had different priorities in terms of what their land grant missions were, et cetera. So part of it is just the storied history of Berkeley has led to, and our department has led to just a, a big advantage in that area. You know, other privates like Princeton and Harvard and Caltech also have very storied astronomy departments, but many of the publics are just, they just haven't had the investment that we've had. The investment is, uh, is private, I mean, it's, it, it, I presume. It is now. It didn't used to be, but it is now. Mm -hmm. Okay, any further questions? All very fascinating. Okay, if there's... I, I guess I have, I have one more comment. Is, okay, why don't we because, make this the, the last formal question? No, that's not uh, a question. Is because Dan, uh, the speaker, is, a, uh, is, is, is now a member. Is we're hoping that you will come and talk to us again about some of these other things that you were said that you would talk to us about. <laughs> I would be I would be delighted to. And hopefully even in person. <laughs> uh, yes, that would be in even, particularly that would be person. wonderful too. Yes, I would be delighted to. Okay, excellent. We'll. Uh... We'll uh, search the schedule, uh, Marion, and see if we can't find a slot for him. Okay, uh, well, well, thank you so much for having me. Okay. Hey, well, thanks very much, Dr. Thank Weiss. Thank you for favoring us. Hey, with your, Fantastic with your great talk. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much.